Praise be Jesus Christ, and thank you for joining me for Lexio on the Go. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our scripture readings are taken from Hebrews 9, verses 11 through 15, and the Gospel of John, chapter 19, verses 30 through 35. These readings are given for the feast day of the precious blood, or the most precious blood of Jesus. And what a beautiful feast day in which we honor the blood that has been given to us to redeem us and then, of course, brings about our salvation. So I I believe that all Christians would agree that Jesus died for all, that he redeemed all. In other words, the forgiveness of sins is available to all. The question, I think, and where the disagreement may come is how is that precious blood applied to the individual life? How is that precious blood applied to our soul? And, um, and, and that's, that would be some differences there. Catholics believe that the precious blood of Jesus would be applied to the soul um, at baptism. And then, of course, the grace comes in, the sanctifying grace, uh, to remit the sin. And this also, this blood is applied through the sacraments. In fact, in the sacrament of the Eucharist, we actually... Um, literally really apply that blood to our life uh, by receiving Jesus Christ truly present, really present, body, blood, soul, and divinity. So thank you, Jesus, for shedding your blood for us. Thank you, Jesus, for establishing a church in which you give sacraments in which we can apply that blood to our life um, and, and continue to apply that to our life for our, our salvation, our sanctification. Um, two things to point out, and then we'll kind of go into a study here. Um, in Hebrews, it talks about the blood of Jesus will cleanse our conscience, that it is the blood of Jesus that cleanses us, and we need to, of course, continue to apply the blood of Jesus. It cleanses our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So this blood is necessary not only for to save us, but to move us from death into life so that we can actually serve the living God and not continue to serve ourselves um, through our dead works. And then the, one of my favorite uh, verses is consumatum es. In Latin, um, in John's Gospel, Jesus uh, it says, it is finished is how it translates into English, but in Latin it's consumatum est. And if you see that, con suma, with totality. In other words, Jesus Christ loves us so much, he bled out for us. He gave everything, con summa, with totality. And this then becomes the pattern for us. Jesus on the cross becomes the pattern for us. This is why a crucifix is so important, that we gaze upon a crucifix and we say, that's the pattern, with totality. You know, how do I give myself to my wife? With totality. How do I give myself to my children? With totality. How do I give myself to, within my work, within my job? Um, to those that are under my care with totality. This is a gift of self and, and of course, um, patterned after Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that he gives. So this is central. When we look at, especially within um, the gospel, we see the different times that Jesus shed his blood for us. We think, of course, first and foremost of the crucifixion because we see that so often. But we also have to remember there are five times in which Jesus shed his blood for us the circumcision when he was uh, circumcised as a boy, um, the agony in the garden when he sweat blood, the scourging and all of those times, those wounds on his back and down his uh, thighs and even on his chest, um, the crowning of thorns, which his sacred head, his sacred face was uh, bleeding because of the crown and then ultimately um, the piercing in the side, the nails, uh, the feet uh, at the crucifixion. And why is it that, you know, it, it would just take you know, uh, one drop of blood to redeem us. Why is it that um, these five times happen? Why is it that it's, it's in a sense so gory and graphic and, and you know, put, put before us? And that's to show the extent of his love. It, it's not, in other words, saving us is, is going to be done with great love and great sacrifice and effort. And, and that and is hopefully to win our hearts, that we see our Lord sh- uh, shedding his blood for us all these different times. And is to win our hearts, to show us how much he loves us. Um, all right, I want to go through a little bit of, of really how we need to apply the precious blood, not only to ourselves, but also to our culture. Because there's so many, um, we need to be cleansed, as, as it says in Hebrews 
to be cleansed from our dead works. And it seems that there are so many dead works, but not only just dead actions, but dead thoughts, um, unreasonable thoughts. And I want to point um, really to, to um, a sign that many of you have seen, and this is really, in a sense, a sign of our times, but I guess there is a sign in every time. There are false teachings, false maxims of the world that are presented to us, and we need to be cleansed of those. And the only way we can be cleansed of those is through the precious blood of Jesus Christ, applying Jesus Christ, applying his holiness, his teaching to these areas. So I want to go through um, a sign that you may have been seeing the last uh, probably decade at least or last few years. And I'll put it up here on the notes and you can look by, if you can see this, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can see this, um, that we have, uh, this is a sign that I've seen. Um, it says, first, we believe. So that's the first statement. We believe. Second, love is love. Third, black lives matter. Four, science is real. Five, women are equal. Six, humans are not illegal. And seven, kindness is everything. So what, what are these signs that we see popping up? And again, it's not just new to our time because there's probably a sign in every time, but these signs give us an idea of what is the modern creed um, in our culture. Our three enemies are the devil, the flesh, and the world. This definitely gives us an indication of what the creed is for the world. So just like we have the 12 articles of the Apostles' Creed, these in a sense would be the seven false maxims, uh, false teachings of the world. So I want to go through, you know, how would we talk about these? Typically it's kind of, you know, we may see this sign in a yard and then get frustrated and be like, ah, oh, you know. And, and it, we, we should actually not just attack these things with emotion, but we should think about these things, enter into a conversation. So I want to walk through a very simple thing, you know, some thoughts that I had as I see these signs and um, apply them, of course, or apply the precious blood of Jesus to each one of these. So we believe, that first thing, we believe. What is that really saying? With all of these, what are we really saying here? There is a tendency in our society right now to have a, a fraternity, a brotherhood, a humanistic, um, you know, let us, let us all this get in this together. And of course, in a sense, that's not bad, but a, a human fraternity, um, a brotherhood without a fatherhood is the mistake here. So what this is really saying is man alone, and if man can come together and agree upon everything, man can solve his own problems. So really it's a brotherhood without a fatherhood. It is man without God when we say we believe in these things. And in other words, if you don't believe these things, then you're not a part of the group. And if you're not a part of the group, then you're a part of the problem. So the we believe here is, um, again, this fraternity, this humanity without God, this brotherhood without a fatherhood. What happens when the father leaves the house? The siblings then run everything. And when the siblings run everything, who's in charge? It usually is the person that speaks the loudest, that's the more powerful, the more manipulative. Many times in our society, this is what we see. We see that without God, this absolute truth, then the subjectivism of, of man it's just whoever is the loudest, the more convincing, the more manipulative, the more powerful. Um, so that's the first part. The second, love is love. Again, what does that mean? A tree is a tree. Two is two. Love is love. What this really means is not love is love. What's behind this? It, it really is that any sexual act is equal to any other sexual act. Particularly here, what is being uh, promoted is homosexual acts. So basically, love is love. Okay, taking that a little bit further, the homosexual act is equal to the heterosexual act. In other words, um, reducing love, uh, or in a sense, saying that the sexual act is love and that all sexual acts, in a sense, are the same. I don't maybe don't go that far, but at least homosexual acts are the same as heterosexual acts. And we know this is just not true. Um, we believe from Scripture that God is love. And so, um, yes, the sexual act is a loving act. But when the sexual act is done outside of God's law, in fact, it is not love at all. So let me say that again. When the sexual act, which was created by God and has parameters set by God, when that sexual act is outside the law of God, it is not love 
at all. In fact, it would be the opposite. It would be uncharitable um, to, to um, use the sexual act outside of God's parameters. So what does God ask of the sexual act? It's very simple, and that is the sexual act needs to be between one man and one woman, and that sexual act needs, between, needs to be between a married man and a married woman. Um, so the sexual act within marriage, marriage, one man, one woman, um, and, the sec- and the marriage needs to be, of course, within the church um, if there is a Catholic party involved. So sex within marriage, marriage within the church. Um, okay, the next one is Black Lives Matter. So this has been at least the last three or four years something that has come up a lot. Um, if you look in the notes, you're going to have to go down to number six because I messed up there. But I just want to kind of say, you know, what are, what are we talking about here? Black Lives Matters. So it's probably talking about, of course, racism. And we know as Catholics that um, we all come from Adam and Eve. This is a clear teaching of the church that everyone on the face of the earth, all eight billion of us, come from one set of parents, Adam and Eve. What does that mean? That means that we are all coming from the same place. Um, Yes, there are different ethnic groups. Yes, we come from different places and speak different languages and eat different food and have different cultures. But ultimately, we are all one. So no one can have a claim that one ethnic group is better than another. Um, We are all um, coming from the same place. So I want to read from the notes here. All are from Adam and Eve. All are from Adam and Eve. Um, In Christ, there is no Jew or Gentile. So you remember that... You know, there was a separation between the Jews and the other nations, but in Christ, we all can become into the church, all equal. In other words, there are no reserved seating in the church, in the Mass. Um, everyone is there, uh, can come equal. Um, in regards to slavery itself, in regards to work itself, uh, we should not defraud a laborer their pay. So if, if we have someone working for us and we are not paying them their, their just due, that is a sin. But to also have force someone to work against their free will is, is of course, a, a, a further injustice, and that's what slavery would be. So um, when we talk about these things, of course, we need to remind people of the church teaching and that um, the human being has the human being has dignity in and of themselves, and they are to be, to be treated that way with dignity and with respect. Um, okay, the next one. Science is real. What is that? What is that talking about? Is that does that kind of assume that maybe people would believe that science is fake? As Catholics, we definitely understand science. We appreciate science. We appreciate science. It really, just means knowledge. So here we're talking about the knowledge of material things. Um, we believe in the material. We believe in the spiritual. We say in our creed, uh, we believe in the God of both the visible and the invisible. Um, And so with this, we believe in visible and invisible. Um, We believe in matter and in spirit. Um, So, you know, with science, it's it's a matter of understanding the material, but also, you know, not not doing things with material that God would not want us to do. So not misusing the gifts that God has given us. So in other words, I guess a basic thing would be with science, just because we can do something doesn't mean we ought to do that. Just because we can with our technology or we can with our knowledge um, doesn't mean we ought to do that. Um, a lot of different things come in here with our medical ethics, but we, we, we take the material world, we understand the material world, but we understand that the laws of nature um, do not, uh, you know, uh, they're not above God's laws. God's law is the supreme law. And God has given us natural laws to be obeyed, but not to be misused. Um, Okay, the next one is women are equal. Again, what is this really trying to say? Is this is this trying to say that um, that that men are more equal than than women? Um, I think this is really what this is getting at is uh, abortion and contraception and what people would call reproductive rights. Um, And so women should have the same choice as men, I guess is what it's saying. Um, But when you get down to this, it's important to kind of unpack this. Of course, man and woman are equal in dignity, definitely equal in dignity. Um, But they do have different roles. Um, God did create man 
and women, woman, equal in dignity, but with different roles. And so we will have different roles. And in fact, one of the most obvious is um, one of the ways that God created woman is to have life, to be able to conceive and bear a child and bring forth that child. This is maybe the greatest honor any human can ever have. Um, man cannot do that. So although a man is equal to a woman in dignity, a man is not equal to a woman in the role of conceiving, bearing, and bringing forth life. So th these is just, this is just one example. So I think that this is trying to pit the sexes against each other, that woman, women are equal. Um, of course, women should be treated uh, justly um, as far as pay is concerned and other things. Um, but when this gets into a sexual war, in a sense, man against woman, woman against man, but also when this gets down to um, really basically having a right to um, abortion, we know that life begins at conception and life should be protected from conception until natural death. And although you'd say a woman has a right to her body, that's, that's the claim that a woman has a right to her body, um, the woman does not have the right to end a life. Um, and the woman does not have a right over the body that is within her. And we can't forget God's rights in all of these things. So we say women's rights, women's rights, man's rights, all these individual rights. What about the right of God? What about the right of God who created that life? A man and a woman cannot create a life without God. So although the man and the woman give the physical pieces of that, right, uh, the, the sperm and the egg, it'll be God that gives the soul. This is what we believe. And so um, God has a right, and we do not go against God's rights. Uh, we also don't go against his commandments. Um, the next one, uh, next one, humans are not illegal. This is, of course, talking about immigration. This is talking about how, you know, we shouldn't, um, you know, it's pretty much politics and, and um, having people cross borders and different things like that. Um, we have to remember, ultimately, in this, that... Um, God is the king of kings, that he is the ultimate authority of things, and so um, the temporal authority must be submissive to God. Any human law that does not square with God's law is no law. Just ha in, this, in this regard, since this is talking about the, the rights of a government to make rules, a government does have the right to make rules. Um, the government has a right to protect its borders. The government has a right to do what is best for it for its country but in doing all of that and making those laws the government the temporal government has to be respectful to the laws of god so this is i think of maybe all of these this may be the trickiest one because it does have to do with a lot of prayer and and it can in a sense be based on the situation at the time and applying the um, human law making sure that the human law squares or does not conflict with um, God's law. And then seven. Seven, kindness is everything. And so this is kind of interesting because we have the, the concept of sin and grace. Um, and so what is the new sin? What is the sin according to the world? It's being mean. If you're mean, that is sin. Well, what would be grace? Well, just be kind. And so meanness is to be avoided and kindness is to be, um, of course, pursued. Um, so when we say kindness is everything, it's kind of like saying that if, if I can just be kind and everyone can be kind, then everything will be just great. Everything will be wonderful. It kind of takes us back to number one. Um, number one would be we believe, right? We believe. Okay, we, we're all in this together. And if we're all just going to be kind to each other, then we'll, everything will, in a sense, if we all agree to be kind to each other, then there will be no wars, there will be no hunger, um, we can solve our own problems. So one and seven kind of go together. But, but again, who determines what is kind? You know, kindness is a subjective thing. Was that kind or not? Who, who without God, if we're, if we're all deciding, if, if we believe and, and, all, and man is deciding this, who will determine and define for us what kindness is? We all have to be kind because kindness is everything, but who determines that? Um, and so... It's good that we actually have not kindness as the rule, but we have um, right and wrong. We, of course, have um, God's commands to guide us. It is God who will tell us what is right and wrong. And, and God is objective. He's not going to change. In other words, goodness and what is right will not change. Um, so 
This isn't very extensive and we could go a lot more into all of these areas, but it's just a little bit of a take on the fact of maybe if anything, when we see the messages, the false teachings of the world, I, I think our first reaction uh, shouldn't be just to just be angry and, and to get mad, but and, and to just, I don't know, let our emotions run, run uh, wild. We should uh, take some time to think about what is really being said here, what is really being said by these statements, and then what does Christ and his church say about these statements? And I think we can take that to prayer and, um, and meditate on that and then enter into conversations with people about that. Um, thank you for joining me for Lexio on the Go. Please take the time to visit linktoliturgy.com where you'll find fast, free, and faithful resources on the gospel. Also, we do have an online school. Please check out linktoliturgy.teachable.com. Uh, please like and share um, these videos. We have a lot of videos, I think over 600 now on the channel. So subscribe and like and share, please. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, 